We do what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. So as we are with Jesus, we become like Jesus. As we become more like Jesus, we do the things Jesus did. And the simplest understanding of what it means to do what Jesus did is we become living demonstrators of love in the world. Welcome to Practicing the Practices. This is an experiential podcast. Our mission is to help you not only learn about the way of Jesus, but practice the way of Jesus in your everyday life. It's Brad. And I'm Casey, and we're glad you're joining us for episode four of season two. We're continuing our mini series on simplicity, and today we're talking about simplicity in our life with Jesus. Really, we're unpacking a threefold vision for living in apprenticeship to Jesus every day. Casey, for several years, we've been refining our language. When I say we, I mean our church, but also our greater movement with the podcast. We've been refining our language in our vision around a culture of helping people grow and mature in their faith. And recently, we expanded that beyond our church to other church leaders at our, a recent network gathering where both of us serve. And we developed and presented a framework for life with Jesus that serves as a guide for discipleship, a foundational block, if you will, for life with Jesus. Uh, This framework is simple, but it's also historical and it's biblical, and it's not easy or simplistic, but what we've tried to do is uncomplicate the spiritual life, the disciples' life with Jesus, and bring clarity to what that looks like. It's so important, Brad, because I think as we've been talking about simplicity, people don't necessarily associate this to their life with Jesus. We associate it like we have with our budget, our time, our Mm -hmm. stuff, but really the gospel is simple Mm. and the way of Jesus is pretty simple. It's not easy. It's not, it's a narrow road. It's a difficult path sometimes, but it's not. It's not as complex as we would like to make it. And so it's been really important to us to just simply lay out what does it really look like to follow Jesus? So when I describe this framework to people, I usually begin with this parable. So my father was the quintessential blue-collar mechanic plumber handyman. And to help me and my brothers go to summer camp and play baseball and those sorts of things, he would do side jobs on the weekend or sometimes week weekday evenings, and he would bring me along as his apprentice. And in the early days when I'm, you know, preteen, 10, 11 years old, I would just essentially follow my dad around on the job site and watch and observe. I would pick stuff up. I was the cleanup guy. Eventually, I progressed to the, I know what the tools are called, and so I could go and fetch a tool and give it to him. But as time went on, I kind of transitioned from merely being with him and observing to participating with him, sharing in the job. So next thing you know, I'm, I'm cutting pieces of pipe or I'm screwing this part into you know, whatever apparatus we're working on. And then eventually, I actually began to share in the jobs, and I would do a part of it, like unsupervised. He might come and check and make sure it was working. So over the years, I would spend time with my dad. I became like my dad, and my mom would say in more ways than just, you know, kind of handyman kind of stuff. We like, I like the same kind of movies as he did, you know, just typical father-son stuff. But I began to do the things that my dad did. So now here I am as a grown adult. I just remodeled my daughter's bathroom. I fixed my refrigerator and... That is not because I went to some sort of trade school or anything. It is it is a result of the apprenticeship I had with my dad. And I think that is a bit of what I think Jesus invites us into. In Matthew chapter 4, we have the initiation of Jesus' ministry. Jesus invites this group of men and even women to go on this journey with him. And it is a history-changing moment, but it didn't begin with large-scale marketing. 
Like this wasn't some sort of like Roman strategy situation. Jesus simply invites this group of prospective disciples to follow him. So you'll like this, Casey. Recently, I've been preparing to do some training with pastors in Africa. And this African pastor who is leading this church planning network, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that I'm coming over to do training. They should be training us. Hmm. But they have this group of disciples, and they call them potentials. Hmm. So they're like new converts. They're early in their walk with Jesus, and he has labeled them as potentials because he's imagining that they're going to be able to plant churches, lead small groups, do all these things in these remote parts of Ghana in West Africa. Well, Jesus essentially uh, taps some potentials, and his invitation was, follow me. I, I think this is really important, Casey. His invitation on the front end was not come and die. Hmm. Right. His, his first invitation was not take up the cross and follow me. Like we love those. Those are super inspirational. His first invitation was to follow me, to be with me. The language we like to use is to abide or be with Jesus. That's such a beautiful story about you and your dad. And I love how that just illustrate so beautifully what it looks like to abide. What I'm also hearing you say is, is that you're volunteering to come do free plumbing work at my house when things break down. Like the disciples often misunderstood <laughs> Jesus parables. You missed that one. <laughs> um, my husband is not really into okay. you, Casey, plumbing work. And so when my garbage disposal breaks, I'm going to be calling you. Yes. But the general audience listeners, we love you. But no, my wife says no. For you, Casey, yes. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. So when we think about abiding, I really loved the way J.C. Ryle encouraged his readers to keep up a habit of constant close communication with Jesus, to always be leaning on him, resting on him, pouring out our hearts to him and using him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. What do you mean when you talk about abiding this first piece of our model? Well, the reason we use the word abide is because that's the language of John in the New Testament. So when John is describing life with Jesus, he has this metaphor of the vine in the branches, right? And the healthy, fruitful branches stay connected to the vine, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we get that metaphor. And that's what we're talking about in abiding, that when you stay connected to Jesus, and there are multiple ways we do that, right? So we have his written revelation, right? We have him revealed to us in his word. So when we spend time in the word, we meditate on his revelation to us when we're abiding. When we are conversing with our Heavenly Father through prayer, we're abiding. When we take some time in silence and solitude, maybe next to a river, and we are observing the glory of creation, we're abiding. Those practices allow us to stay connected through the power of the Holy Spirit to the divine. And this is not as mystical as we imagine it. We have a creator. God designed and intended for us to be in meaningful relationship with him, and that's the invitation. So when we talk about abiding, uh, there is a very sense in which we are saying in the same physical way in which the disciples spent time with Jesus, listen to Jesus' teaching, we do the same. We spend time with Jesus, we listen to his teaching, we learn from him. Again, not complicated, but not easy either. I think this abide piece is a missing piece in a lot of people's model of spirituality because we want to kind of get stuff done. We mm -hmm. want to do things that are measurable. And so at the end today, when we practice, we're going to really talk a little bit more about it, what it looks like to actually practically abide. But what's the second piece of this model, Brad? The second piece is what we call holiness. Jesus invited his disciples to follow him, to observe from him, and over time they became like him. So back to my original parable, if you were to talk to my mom, you know, there are certain character traits I have, certain tastes in movies, in food, in pie, in, in some of the work and hobbies I have that are similar to my father's that are primarily a result of just being around him, right? Right. And the more you abide with Christ in his word, 
in prayer, in meditation, all of the many of the practices that we've talked about here, the more through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus begins to form and shape us. So another biblical metaphor, right? The potter and the clay, right? The way the, the potter wets the clay, molds the clay, heats the clay, begins to decorate the clay. Jesus does that with our inner and outer selves, with our hearts, our anxieties, our disposition to love. He shapes us. He begins to root out. So so again, you've, you've mentioned this a few times, simple but not easy. So when the sanctification process happens and the Spirit of God is rooting out anger, impatience, lust, all of those things that 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 <laughs> surgery, right? It's not a good time. It's it's <laughs> it is a surgery, and there's oftentimes a recovery period. That is God working into us to make us holy. So holiness is maybe one of the more underappreciated aspects of discipleship today. I think there's a great appreciation for the wellness aspect of abiding. You know, even non-Christian people have, are moving towards spirituality, mindfulness, those sorts of things. And then little preview here, our last bit's going to be love. People are pro-love. Mm-hmm. But in the Jesus vision, there is a dying to self and coming a life into the image of Jesus. That is really demanding. For sure. What I love about this model, though, and the way that God has set this out is that this comes as a result of abiding, not as a result of striving. So I think Mm. a lot of times we can really emphasize rules or getting it right or doing everything perfectly and think that that's holiness. And yes, this will result in a change in our choices and our behaviors and our desires Mm. even, but it's coming from being with Jesus. It's not coming from striving and seeking perfection. Yeah, and there is a kind of striving that we do that is driven by grace, right? So there is, and and again, this is where we got to read the scriptures through the ancient Eastern eyes of the original readers. When they think about striving, they don't connect it to achievement the way we do, right? I mean, there is some language in the New Testament, I press towards the prize, the high calling, but Mm -hmm. what is Paul after? He is not after some sort of moral benchmark. What he is describing is my ultimate achievement is union with Jesus. Like his striving is to abide better, Hmm. right? So there is a grace-driven effort. You know, Willard says, um, effort is not opposed to grace, earning as opposed Mm -hmm. to grace. So we don't achieve holiness in in that sense by our own merit. It's a work of grace in us that, again, as you said, the more you spend time with Jesus, the more surrendered you are, the more you allow his spirit-guided surgical scalpel into your life, combined with, this is a beautiful metaphor of the Holy Spirit in the scriptures, the oil, which is kind of the healing agent of the Spirit, the more He mends brokenness in us, and we become holy. One misconception that I think is also important to mention here. When we think of holiness, we often think of holiness as only some sort of like righteous sinlessness. And, and God was holy in that sense. But the the more complete definition of holy is not just holy, H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, that God is wanting to complete us. Mm -hmm. He's trying to take us back to Eden, where we are in harmony with the divine and who he made us to be. That's a beautiful picture. I love that. I love all things holistic. You know that about Mm, me. So that definitely strikes a chord with me. So you already kind of gave a spoiler about the third component of this model. Tell us a little bit more about love. So the third piece is we do what Jesus did. So as we are with Jesus, we become like Jesus. As we become more like Jesus, we do the things Jesus did. And the simplest understanding of what it means to do what Jesus did is we become living demonstrators of love in the world. Now, when you and I and most of our listeners hear the word love, here's how Jesus said it, right? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
when we hear that, we hear degrees of love, or we hear like elevating passion and enthusiasm, which is good, but it is not precisely what Jesus meant there. When Jesus said, with all of your heart, in the, that ancient Eastern understanding, he was referring less to our emotions and more to the center of our being. The Greeks would have called it our ethos. We would kind of understand it as our deepest uh, sense of self, our values. It's kind of it's what determines you know our behavior. And so, what Jesus is saying when he tells his disciples, like he or he tells the, the the teacher, he's trying to trick him up. Hey, what's the most important thing? And he says, "Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind." He is saying, "Love God with all of your life, your career, your recreation, your money." Uh, your hopes, your dreams, love him with all of that, right? And love your neighbor like yourself. Hmm. And so when Jesus is tested, okay, what does neighbor love look like? Jesus tells the famous story of the Good Samaritan, which to his original audience would have really clearly articulated that love is not just about you and your homies. It's not about just you and your BFFs going for coffee and loving one another. But it is very much about loving the person who's other, on the margins, the outsider, right? That was the Samaritan. And so the point is, love of God and love of others requires sacrifice. So when you think love, we want to think more than sentiment. That's kind of the American way. Love is sentiment, Hallmark cards, Hallmark movies, no offense. (laughs) But love is sacrifice. Recently, I've really been drawn to the work of Bob Goff. I mean, it's not anything new, but I've just been reading a lot about a lot of his thoughts lately on love. He has some really great thoughts on it. And his book is actually called Love Does, summing up exactly what you're saying right now. He says, love is never stationary in the end. Love doesn't just keep thinking about it or keep planning for it. Simply put, love does. We've all, I think, maybe been on the receiving end of somebody that's like, oh, we should get together sometime. Oh, like, you know, I would love to hang out sometime. And then never really follows through. Mm -hmm. How often are we doing that and loving other people? We're like, well, I just really need to pray about more ways for me to love Brad and his family. Instead, just start doing it. Mm. That is so good. I love it. Love does. So in summation, here's the framework. A vision for life with Jesus is about abiding It's about holiness and it's about love. Uh, The language that Dallas Willard, John Mark Comer, and others have kind of shaped over the years that we also use is to abide is to be with Jesus. Uh, Holiness is to become like Jesus. And to love is to do what Jesus did. Now, Casey, this is practicing the practice. So it's a little bit of extra content for the framework, but let's practice one of these aspects of life with Jesus. Yeah, so we're going to practice today the first part, which is to be with Jesus, to abide. And the way we're going to do that is because, again, abiding can be something that we know we're supposed to do it, but we don't exactly know what that looks like. It can feel really abstract. And you gave a lot of great ideas of what that can look like. It's a really broad term. One specific way that we're going to introduce today helps maybe just make this a little more concrete, which is practicing the presence of God. And this phrase, practicing the presence of God, comes from a book of the same name by Brother Lawrence. It's a great read, a classic, highly recommended if this is piquing your interest. And so if the first step of this process of life with Jesus is to just be with him, it's essential, like you talked about, Brad, in order to find holiness and love for other people, it's essential for us to first just be with Jesus. So what is practicing the presence of God? It's a simple practice. And again, that doesn't mean that it's easy, but it's simple. The Gospel Coalition describes this practice as growing in being aware of and responding to God's presence, increasingly being consciously present in the presence of God. I love the way Paula D'Arcy said, God comes to you disguised as your life. That is a beautiful picture of wow. what yeah, practicing the presence of God is. Do we believe that God is as present in this moment of driving or doing the dishes or 
meeting with your boss or sitting in an English class? Is he as present there as he is when you're in church or reading your Bible or praying? He's there. He's revealing himself when you're stuck in a conversation with that person who annoys you or when you keep getting interrupted while you're trying to get work done or when you're walking your dog in the park. God is, so this practice really is coming from the assumption that God is in all of these moments. God comes to you disguised as your life. C.S. Lewis says, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. So our practice today is simply to start to notice God's presence with you, whatever you're doing for the rest of this day. Or if you're listening to this at night tomorrow, same thing. So before the transitions of your day, ask God to make you aware of his presence with you in the next activity, no matter what it is. And while you're in that activity, be on the lookout for God. Karen Maines wrote a book that's called God Hunt, and she really talks about this practice like going on a God hunt in your day, being aware of how God might be speaking to you in the ordinary and even mundane moments of your day. Adele Calhoun suggests that throughout the day, whenever you find yourself interrupted, you say to God, I'm here, knowing that God is often speaking to you in the interruptions. So for the next part of your day, no matter what you're doing, give yourself a little prompt. Say to God, I'm here and I'm looking for how you are present in this moment with me, God. And then noticing really that are the things that are spiritually significant or the spiritual themes of even the mundane activities that you're, we would might tend to view as non-spiritual and really pray through those things, like doing the dishes, like walking your dog. I really love the book, Every Moment Holy by Douglas McKelvey, and he gives really good examples of how things like cooking or nature, I think he even has one about beekeeping. I don't beekeep, but if I did, I would be praying this liturgy that he's written, can have so many beautiful spiritual themes. So practicing the presence of God, simple, but also a reframe of our mind that whatever I'm doing, God, you're present and will you show up? I'm on a God hunt for you for the rest of this day. Will you show up and reveal yourself in whatever I'm up to? Casey, that's so consistent with the Jesus of the New Testament, who would often take a fish Hmm. or a piece of bread or an empty vase. Or or, a bird. Yeah. Or a wildflower. All of those things and connect it to relationship with the Father. Mm -hmm. So folks, thanks so much for listening to Practicing the Practices. And as much as we are grateful that you listened, maybe even subscribed, we want you to practice it. So right now. Let's practice the presence of Jesus. This is Brad for Casey. Again, thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe. Share this with someone who might benefit from it. Until next time, grace and peace.